Not much really has to be said when you play those guys up north. I want them to win every game and lose to us. <laughs> that way, that game at the end is like 06, where it's one versus two, and it's, it's important. There's a national championship at stake. It was a playoff before the playoff system started, so it didn't get any bigger than that. So you better win, understanding that if you don't win, there would be a different type of pressure on you out there, too. And then the unfortunate news of, of Bo passing. I wasn't coached by him, but to me, he was bigger than football. We got to go out here and play for Coach Schenbacher. It was our brother, so to speak, who we were fighting, our Big Ten brother. Ten years later, you just still think of what could have been. That 2006 season, there had never been a Michigan-Ohio State game where two teams were ranked one and two and undefeated. And the national championship game is the opportunity you were going to receive if you won that game. So everybody knew on both sides uh, what was at stake. Back in 2006, the reputation for the Big Ten Conference was always the asterisk with butt behind it. And I think that's why we kind of had a chip on our shoulder. We have something to prove. We play good football here. We got a chance to embark on our conditioning test early in the year, cut 110. So we kind of just cut the field in half and you go crisscross and you go back and forth. When I tell you it was the most competitive drill in just us being conditioned, that's when I knew that we had kind of turned and flipped the page and knowing and asserting ourselves as the best team in the Big Ten and quote unquote the best team in the country. Ohio State, they had their stud starting quarterback back in Troy Smith. And they had a couple of guys on defense that you knew were going to be stars. James Lord Knights was coming on big time as a leader in that group. Malcolm Jenkins, eventual first round draft pick, was coming on. And then you've got this electrifying uh, lightning bolt at one of the offensive spots named Ted Ginn Jr. I think anybody could see there was potential there to maybe have a really gangbuster offense and, and, a, and a defense that could at least make plays when they need to make plays. Why this Ohio State offense is getting so much attention is because they have so much talent. I think In 2006, I was a color analyst uh, for ESPN. We had Ohio State earlier in the season, Ohio State at Texas, and that was a number one versus number two game. I don't think there was a more improved quarterback in college football than what Troy Smith became. In fact, he went from a athletic, unpolished, mistake guy with a tremendous upside to a very polished quarterback. Comes back the other way. Touchdown, Rubisky. As a quarterback, you can kind of take things for granted at times, but then when it starts to click and you start to understand that every other guy on the field is just as important as you. Uh, not only that, when you put an emphasis on understanding that every play is just as important as the next, you understand that collectively we all do this together and this is the one thing that Tress did for me from a redshirt freshman on to when I got to graduate. Here's the thing about Jim Trussell. People have spoken a lot about Trussell ball. When you play Trussell ball, you're going to play phenomenal special teams, great defense opportunistic offense. Well, I think Trussell Ball was a little bit before me. When Jim Trussell trusts his quarterback, and that is to make great decisions, sometimes it means pull the ball down and don't throw it, things like that, he, he turns it loose. And that's what he did with Troy Smith. Troy Smith flushed, reverses his field, got a block from Pittman, going deep, got a man in the end zone. The way he was progressing, those were a lot of the expectations we had for him. But I think the watershed moment was when he decided he wanted to know it all. That, I think, was the, the switch that was flipped. And once he decided that, you could see his improvement day by day. Touchdown, Buckeyes. It's all scarlet and gray. 
Those scores represent a lot of games where I didn't even get a chance to finish the game. I used to seriously find myself running and trying to hide from then coach uh, Daryl Hazel, who was our receiver coach. He was always a guy who would yank me and just give me the, you know, you're out of the game. We had an unbelievable amount of confidence from position to position. We had Troy as a quarterback and really good receivers, depth at the running back. We had very good defensive players, so we knew pretty early uh, in the season that we were going to be a good football team. When did you guys recognize what Michigan is doing? All year. All year. We definitely know what Michigan is doing all year long. If you're going to be a Buckeye through and through and, and truly bleed Scarlet and Gray, you pay attention to who is the quote unquote most important team. The year before we were 7 and 5, so nobody expected us to really do anything. I knew that we were special from that season because a lot of games that we had lost, it wasn't like we got blew out. There were about a touchdown, a couple points. So we had a lot of guys returning from my senior year. Here's Lloyd Carr leading the Wolverines out of the field at Michigan Stadium. And that senior year, we were looking for a defensive coordinator. And I was like, Coach Carr, you don't need to look for a new defensive coordinator. We got one right here with Ryan English. Everybody had fun. They enjoy coming to the facility every day. The whole mindset was, was changed, definitely on defense. Uh, I remember we was riding to the game on game day, and for years the bus was always quiet. Like, it was just a quiet thing. So we was like, man, we're going to start a chant on the bus. Even in the locker room before we went out during the game, we started a chant in there. Something to get the guys fired up, and, and it worked. We came out, we hit the, we hit the banner. And we had a chant there. We used like that Ray Lewis chant. And, uh, Elijah Bradley did. It was like, any dogs in the house, roo, 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 you know, that one. Small chants like, Michigan football, what time is it? It's time to get live. It's time to represent. In trouble again. Woodley's got him. Slams him down. And the Wolverine front dominates. We went out there, Coach E said, we're going to run. I know I got to cut that off. He said, we're going to run. These 10 plays, I don't give a what. We're going to attack. We're not going to get attacked. We're going to keep coming and coming. We're going to be the aggressive. I said, hell yeah, Coach E. We attacking. We ran 10 to 11 plays. That's it. The whole year, starting from spring ball, we had those plays mastered. We went down to Notre Dame. We got after that quarterback. Brady Quinn ain't know what to do. We hit him play after play after play. We was breaking him. Penn State game, we knocked out two quarterbacks. We attacked them. We ain't finna sit back and figure out what y'all gonna do. We finna hit y'all in the mouth, and then y'all adjust to what we're doing. It was a great football team, talented at every position, and they wanted to win the national championship, and uh, they wanted to win the Big Ten championship. That 2016, it talked about those goals right from the beginning of the training camp. Full disclosure, what you need to remember about 2006, particularly in Michigan, is that out of nowhere, during the first two months of the football season, we had a pennant race, and the Tigers had not been to the World Series since 1984. So there was a lot of focus on baseball, in Detroit specifically. So when the season ended, that's when I think a lot of people started focusing their attention on the Michigan Wolverines and saying, you know what, if they go to Penn State and, and win this game, and they did the week right after they beat Michigan State, they should at least get to that Ohio State game undefeated. And oh my God, Ohio State's undefeated too. The record is still caught for a touchdown by Mario Manningham. This was the Big Ten at its zenith. You got the greatest rivalry in college football enhanced 10 times by, by being the game of the century. The first time they'd ever played one versus two with a trip to the uh, Bowl Championship Series national title game on the line. I mean, wow. How could it get any bigger than that? I remember an influx of positivity. There was not one person that were in the confinements of Ohio State's campus that thought that we were going to lose. The energy just all week. Um, 
you know, from the mirror leg jump to just everything of, of one verse two, the hype, all the crazy talk of should just, just be the national championship game, you know, and should there be a rematch after this. It was insane. Coach Carl was, this is Ohio State week, and from the moment that we installed plays on Sunday, the coaches are amped up from that day. The message is out, don't say anything stupid to hurt the team, you know, especially to me, because, <laughs> you, know, you know, back in my young days, I said a lot of crazy things, and the biggest thing was just let the pads do the talking. Brent Musburger and myself went up to Michigan I believe it was a Wednesday night. And I really thought back to 2005 when I was up there. Fans were getting a little restless and there was some howling about Lloyd Carr. And I remember to this day, Bo Schembechler saying to me, if they're going to get the Lloyd Carr, talking about the fans, they have to go through me first. And there we were a year later, Lloyd Carr's coaching an undefeated football team that Saturday is playing in Columbus, Ohio. But it, to me, highlighted the presence of every time you went into Michigan football offices, Bo Schembechler. Back to 69, Bo brought Michigan football back. And we've done, we've come back. And he was the architect of, of Michigan football. If we keep improving, yeah. believe in ourselves, yeah. 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 I'll never forget the, you know, the first time I met him and Bo, the way he talks is, I get too little to play running back here. You know, joking around, challenging me, but that's what he challenged everybody that he knew. Will you go to the game I, I, it, it's too hard for me to walk. I, I couldn't, uh, I don't know where I would end up, even if they You know, he talked to the team Thursday night, like he always did before Ohio State, and, you know, it came down to the trenches, like he would always say. Just saying things to get the guys fired up. You know, because he was one of Michigan's greatest coaches. When he's coming in there and he's speaking, you listen. And there it is. What has to be the upset of the century. Oh, talked about that they were so lucky to have the opportunity to play at Michigan and to play in a game of this magnitude. I came here to Michigan in 1974 to work for him. First day in the job, he told me, he says, Falk, we want to beat Ohio State, but you remember one thing. We respect Ohio State, we take care of Ohio State, and we take care of Woody Hayes. Woody Hayes! He talked about some great players at Michigan, Jim Manich in 1969, Tom Slade telling him how important the Michigan-Ohio State game was. I remember Bo talking about how important it was for Michigan. After the speech, I shook Bo's hand and I said, Bo, that was a great talk. He says, thanks, Falk. I walked out of that door and little did I know that that would be the last time that I ever get to shake Bo Schembechler's hand and talk to him. I was a sports reporter at WXYZ Channel 7, the ABC affiliate in Detroit, Michigan. November 17th, 2006. It was a, an exciting day, without question. So my assignment was to go to Columbus and you know, be there for when the team bus arrived, do a little pregame hit for our news on Friday night, and then be ready for Saturday's game. So we were there bright and early, and every Friday, Don Shane, our sports director, and Bo Schembechler, Taped the Big Ten ticket. Are you surprised they went to him and asked him, Do you want to stay on? Are you surprised he decided to stay on and coach no, the remaining game? It's games? been done before, and he's a gentleman, I think. We were shooting the breeze back in the sports office, and I was showing him pictures of what at that time was my five month old daughter. And he goes, You stay on the fray down there in Columbus. That girl needs a father. Ha 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 ha. Everyone laughs. We all break up. We go our separate ways. I go to the assignment desk to get my directions to Columbus. It's pre-GPS. Everybody goes where they're going. Life changed a minute later. That's when someone came screaming out of our bathroom. Call 911, Bose collapsed. 
My photographer who was going with me to Ohio State was certified in CPR. I loosened Bo's tie, I took off his glasses, put them in my pocket, and the two of us literally were over Bo, doing everything we could. I don't know if you've ever been involved in a life or death situation with anybody. I hadn't, and in the 10 years since, I haven't again, but it was Bo Schembechler. 77-year-old coach arrived at Providence Hospital at 9.38. The team of doctors worked on him for over two hours. He came in unresponsive with full CPR. And despite over two hours of continuous resuscitation, his heart would just not, not come back. I was several miles from the stadium when I heard that news. So we had a five-minute meeting before getting on the bus for Columbus. I found out before we actually went in the team meeting room. I was just thinking, wow, this is, you know, it's, it's crazy during a time like this. I went in to tell them, and uh, it was a hard thing to do. It was a hard thing for me to do uh, because I cared about Bo and I cared about those kids. One of the greats passed away and we going into this game. It's like, we have to go out here and play for him now. I've been asked about it a lot of times. I was not shocked by it because he had a long history of health problems, particularly heart problems. That's a good game, folks. But he also had great resilience. I can't tell you how many times he had to be taken to the hospital. And a day later, he's uh, back in the office. <laughs> and he talked about he was made of blue twisted steel. And uh, so, uh, you know, we, we got used to him going to the hospital. But I don't think any of us ever really thought about him not being with us. It was hard. And I'm sure it was hard for the coaches because they were the ones that truly knew Bo and truly talked to him a lot and truly had a relationship with him. Um, so I can only imagine, you know, what it was like for them, the emotions they were feeling riding that bus down. And our retired chopper seven, they're going to be probably uh, following the buses here from U of M south along State Street toward the airport, 2,000 feet if we can. And I just literally remember the whole trip, helicopters above following us on the highway. That was just kind of the magnitude of the game. No one wanted to miss a moment of what was going on. Here we are. Friday afternoon, the day before the game in Columbus, sitting with assistant coaches from Ohio State, and Jim Trestle walks in and says, Bo just passed away. The whole dynamic of the production of this game changed immediately. It went from forget about Troy Smith, Ted Ginn, Michael Hart. It was all Bo Schembechler because someone that's had that kind of impact on college football, and particularly the Michigan-Ohio State game, it all turned to Bo Beckler at that moment. We got a phone call from our news desk when we were someplace on the road in Ohio that Bo had indeed passed, and I just cried. Uncontrollably, I mean, who wouldn't? He'd been friends to us. And at some point, I just kind of went like that, and I went, oh. And I reached in, and I pulled out his glasses. I still had his glasses in my pocket. To be so close to that moment and understand how it tied into that week, and that weekend, and that game the next day, that was pretty powerful. So the Michigan bus arrives at Ohio Stadium. And we basically got told right away that nobody's talking. The only person who stopped was John Falk. And John Falk was not just the equipment manager at Michigan. John Falk was one of Bo Beckler's best friends. I came up to Michigan, looked around, Bo told me all the advantages to coming to Michigan. Coming back home, I, I thought about it and I said, you know, I don't want to leave my mother and grandmother. I'm going to, I'm going to not take that job. Uh, that night, I told my mom when I got home, I said, I'm not going to take the job here in Michigan. Four o'clock in the morning, my mother woke me up. And she says, it hurts me to tell you this, Johnny, but tomorrow, you're going to Michigan because Bo Schumbeck will take care of you. 
and he's done that for 33 years, and I'm going to miss him a lot. As I walked around the stadium, I got a phone call that Boyd passed away. And I looked around the Ohio State Stadium, and all of a sudden I reminisced about all the great games that Bo had coached here. The 1976 game, the first time he ever beat Ohio State in Columbus, Ohio. Rob Lytle in the Red Bleach, who beat him 22 to nothing. The 1986 game, we came down here, it was a chance for Bo to win the most games for a football coach at the University of Michigan. Jimmy Harbaugh was the quarterback. He brought us back, and we beat Ohio State 26 to 24. And I reminisced about those games. And then all of a sudden, I started to cry. Bo Schumacher will take care of you. And he's done that for 33 years. For me, being down in Columbus on Friday, at the time, I didn't know that I was the only one that had, that had said anything. Now, I, I saw the way the team was acting when they came in, and nobody said anything, and nobody said anything when they left. But I really didn't think about that. It was just a natural thing that somebody would come up and talk to me about Bo. I only have one regret from that whole week of the Michigan-Ohio State. The only regret that I have is I never got to tell Bo Schembechler that I loved him. I was uh, on a recruiting trip in Texas. My dad told me, I mean, he was, he was crying. He had, you know, his voice was cracking, and I just remember going down, like, knees getting weak and going down to one knee, and, uh, and then watched, uh, watched the coverage the rest of the day. The Michigan flag is at half-staff all over campus. We were uh, finishing the season down in Gainesville, Florida, getting ready for the SEC championship. I knew Bo. Bo reached out to me when I became the head coach of Bowling Green. I'll never forget 1987 when I was a graduate assistant at Ohio State at, at uh, the stadium up there that I flipped the door open and I see Bo Schembecker, so I idolized him. But the fact that he reached out to me and his respect for Ohio State, his respect for Earl Bruce, I was there on Earl Bruce's staff. We went up there and we beat Coach Schembechler and 1987, Earl Bruce's last game, so you reach that point where guys are getting older, so it's almost like you're expecting things to happen, but uh, that was a tough moment. My dad coached at Michigan when I was a kid. I mean, Bo was the person to put food on our table. We had a, we had a house. You know, our dad had a job, the most exciting job uh, a dad could have, and we got to go to the games, and, and you know, Bo, Bo stories were at the dinner table, Almost every night, you know. You're not gonna believe what Bo said today, and Bo did this, and you know, he's. We just thought he was the probably the most significant person that that we knew growing up. John, Joni, myself, my dad loved Bo, and uh, you know had us love him too. Oh, quarterback draw, great call. Then being able to play for Coach Schembechler was a great thrill. You always knew you were playing for. A living legend, and then he remained friends after I played. Uh, always would take a phone call and and always give you the the advice, you know, as he saw it. I mean, just hit you right between the eyes. Had a warm hello when you'd call, and you know, and a nice bang of the phone down uh, when the call was over. <laughs> and it always felt like uh, you know you had the right answer. I mean, Bo, I need I need this advice, and you know, he'd give it to you and. Got it. He's the way I grew up. A lot of times cultures in certain areas of the country are created by coaches. And the one culture that he's left behind is do it right. Coach Schembecker always had a premium placed on education. That culture is still alive today. Same with Ohio State with Woody Hayes. So his culture lives on. It's not about this game. It's not about this rivalry. Bo was more than football. He was great for all of higher education. Uh, he was a builder of young men. We lost a great person in our family in this country. Bo Schimbeckler worked for Woody Hayes at Ohio State. He was from Ohio. He was the last coaching link to the 10-year war, the 100-yard war, whatever you wanted to call it. He was the last link to that from a coaching standpoint, still in, sort of involved in the Ohio State-Michigan rivalry. 
I found out about it really on game day that morning, just kind of waking up and uh, watching TV and hearing about it. I didn't know about it until the morning of. We didn't have devices back in those days where people were getting their news so up to date. And when we found out, whenever that was, we handled it within our own emotions. I knew Bo Schembechler from the fact that he grew up in Akron, Ohio, Barberton. He was an assistant to Woody Hayes and then on to Miami and, and then took over Michigan. And when I was coaching at the University of Akron in the mid-70s, because he was an Akron guy, we used to go up and visit him. He had the, you know, the open door for all of us because we were from his hometown. So we got to know him at that point in time. So we thought if he could do it, you know, maybe we could aspire. Seeing one of those legends pass was difficult. I think the fact that it was that moment uh, when the, the crescendo was building for that game and knowing that it was going to be a battle of a game and probably honestly and selfishly I thought darn they're going to have that little extra emotion too those Wolverines might even be more revved up uh, it's going to make life difficult but I think everyone on that field whether you're with Ohio State you know, because we looked at Bo as a Buckeye uh, or you're from Michigan um, you wanted to make sure that you played till the end it just gave all of us just a little bit more uh, purpose you know, a little bit more passion uh, to maybe compete like Bo, and uh, I'm sure that, that happened on both sides. Not much really has to be said when you play, play those guys up north, you know, especially at home. Senior day, Troy Smith, at quarterback, that year was, was magical for him. He was going to find a way to win that game, especially his senior day. Yeah, he's going to find a way to win this one. Troy Smith winning that game pretty much as the Heisman Trophy favorite. And that was on the line, too. Every other game throughout the course of the year is a tremendously important game. Uh, add tremendously important, uh, plus the only thing that's important, plus you better win, plus understanding that in the backyards and in the alleys of these Columbus streets, if you don't win, it would be a different type of pressure on you out there, too. Our mantra back then was Mate Verdute, striving and succeeding for excellence at all times. I actually use that mantra to this day. The interesting thing about Troy Smith was there was a little bit of, oh, I think there was a lot of ham in him. <laughs> when he got introduced on senior day, he comes out and he paws at the field. I don't know if it was a if it was a dragster warming up or if it was a bull. He dragged his feet on the ground, uh, like much like a bull in a, in a, in a, a matador in a bullfight, and uh, yeah, that was pretty neat. Fist in the air and, you know, kind of... I was thinking of what I was going to do. Emotions were flaring. I'm watching my mom on the field with me. I'm watching Guillen Sr. on the field with me. My coach, Jim Tressel. And what that signified was all of the things that I had been through, the accumulation of things leading up to that point, and me moving forward and putting all of that stuff behind me. You know, we're about to embark on something great, and that, and that day, those four and a half, five hours that we were in the stadium, I mean, still to this day, fans still think that's the greatest game that they've seen. Going into that game, there was a lot of um, good nervous energy going on, and you knew how big it was. From the first day of training camp, you are preparing on a daily basis for the Michigan High State game. And when you finally get there, uh, all of the anticipation, the excitement, and especially in this particular game where the entire nation is watching this game. I just reminded them that everything they had worked for since the moment they came to the University of Michigan, the highest goals that you could have were right there in front of us. Let's get yes on three. One, two, three, yes. Let's go.
Lloyd never referenced Bo's death. He didn't say we we're going to go out and win one for Bo or do this for Bo. He never brought that in because he said that that wouldn't serve Bo justice. My job was as best I could keep my team focused on that game. There would be time to mourn, eulogize, and to honor Bo, but for the immediate hours before that game, the job was to get ready to play. Ohio State has lost an alumnus in Frank. The Champ Eckler family has lost a beloved father, grandfather, and husband. Bo made the game of football better in every way. A tribute to Bo. When he said on that PA that he was a friend and an alumni, I think that got the fans a little bit. I think it did. Bo Schembechler meant something to the people in Ohio Stadium as well. It wasn't just for that team up north for the things that they had going on. We, we understood and knew Bo Schembechler also. That just added a little bit more lore to the game. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we settle back and await the college football showdown everyone has been debating since mid-September. The first drive of the game, it kind of got the game going where in the direction we you know we wanted it to go. Three step drop, slant, got it. To the 47 yard line, Mario Manningham. Here's Hart. Hard to bring down with the first man. Henny again, slant, got it. Just shy of the end zone. We went down there and we, and we scored right away. They come back with the running back. Michigan strikes first. Somewhere. Someplace, Bo Schimbeckler is smiling. That was huge for us on offense just because, you know, they had a great defense, great players on that defense. And we knew we could score a lot of points on these guys. Drove right down the field. It's like, oh my God, it was like a hot knife through butter. I'm like, Jesus Christ, here we go. It's on now. Rolling to the right. A strike again for the first down. What are the odds that Troy Smith will throw the ball 11 out of the 14 first place? I wasn't happy. <laughs> Think of Ron English, the Michigan defensive coordinator, as he prepared his game plan all week. All of a sudden, it all changed. Throws for a wide open touchdown, and it's Roy Hall. I think the game plan and the openness in spreading the field shocked everybody, Michigan as well. In order to pass, you have to run, and in order to run, you have to be able to pass. And, and my dad used to say this to me all the time, Ted Ginn Sr., he said, you put all the ingredients in the cake and put it in the oven, you can't stop it from rising. In that game, we had too many mistakes. We did something that we haven't done all year. We gave up big plays. We gave up a big run play to Beanie Wells. We gave up a, a, a big pass play where uh, Ted Ginn was kind of lined up as a tight end and went straight down the field. Touchdown, Ohio State. Those are the two plays that I actually remember about the game. They are good offense, too, so I respect their offense. But they capitalize on our mistakes. That's how it is in football. Somebody make a mistake, the other team capitalize on it. That's who usually win. They capitalize on every mistake that we made. Down 28-14 on the road. Ohio State has 300 and some yards in the first half. I give Michigan so much credit for not panicking. They went at halftime. Defensively, they made the adjustments. But they also realized Mike Hart is a special guy. I always run behind Jake Long, you know, and my mentality was I wanted the ball. First down and Hart breaks free. One man to beat and he pushes him out of bounds. Mike Hart run hard ever since he became a full-time starter his freshman year. To the two-yard line with their opening drive of the second half. Mike Hart was never a guy that you seen going backwards. Every time he was doing a play, he was going forward. 
he did what Mike Hart is supposed to do. Touchdown, Michigan. Call your friends, folks. This one's getting real interesting. The haymakers that these teams threw at each other. I thought Antonio Pittman's run for a touchdown was ridiculous, was huge. Because, again, it was right up the gut. Did it put Michigan away? Not necessarily. Hart stop can't be stopped. They showed exactly who they were that day, a team that would not give up, that dons their colors and wears them tremendously with a tremendous amount of pride, and they got a tremendous amount of fight. Third and a 15 now. The one play that sticks out to me is Sean Crable with the late hit on Troy Smith out of bounds. Smith has to take off. Dances free now. He'll throw incomplete. And a penalty flag. Another Ohio guy in Sean Crable. Thanks, man. Sean Crable helped that, that drive continue to go. Yeah, that, that, that play was uh, very interesting. I'm on the sideline, and I can see the action coming at us. And I start backing up, and uh, the, the, your players are right behind you, so you get pinned. And I still think I'm okay. And all of a sudden, he gets launched on the sideline, undercuts me. I land on my head. Coach Tressa said, Darryl, sig signal in the, I was the signaler. He's like, signal in the next play. And uh, I think I lost a play or two. It's third and forever, and they got automatic first down. Smith was going out of bounds. Personal foul. A huge call with 6.49 to go. To tell you the truth, he got the better of me on that play. If you let a Michigan fan tell you, he'll say that it wasn't a late hit. i become good buddies with Jake Long, who <laughs> he claims that was a bad call, you know. We have good arguments over that. It was, uh, <laughs> it's not a good memory, you know, but uh, the guy who made the call was a good official. So uh, it is what it is. That was a game breaking call at the other day. Right, wrong, or indifferent, it doesn't matter. They made the call. And after that penalty went down to score. In zone. Got it. Touchdown. Brian Robisky. It was a bad mistake. And to this day, he, he talks about that. But me being the team, I don't blame Craper for that. Because if we was up, nobody would look at that play. But being that we were down, you always have to look and blame somebody for something. So most people say, oh, if Craper didn't do hit a late hit on Troy Smith, we would have had a chance to win the football game. But if we wouldn't have gave up those big plays early in the game, we would have won the football game. So look at that. Don't look at the, the last hit. If we don't get that call, you know, it's either fourth or long or, or something. So having that drive continue on was essential to us winning that football game. The Buckeyes beat their arch rival again. I know that it would be a 42-39 to 39 game, but, um, you know, you have to keep up and... Uh, we just felt like as we saw the game unfold, we needed to score points. I haven't gone back and looked at that game on a TV copy or, in fact, what I'm going to do someday if I ever retire is I'm going to go back and get all those TV games and find out what really happened. The Buckeyes beat their arch rival again. When you thought about Ohio State, Michigan, you thought about Bo Schembechler versus Woody Hayes in the mid 1970s when. It was just like this, and they were afraid to call plays that would make a mistake unless they absolutely had to call a pass play. It was an offensive shootout because, first and foremost, you have to give credit to the people and the personnel on the field at the time. You had a NFL quarterback, Heisman Trophy winner, and myself. You had a high-powered NFL quarterback in Chad Haney. My brother, Gian Jr., was down there with him in Miami. And I used to always tell him, you know, I was in Baltimore at the time. I used to always tell him, man, I want to meet Chad. Chad, I don't want to meet you, bro. <laughs> Chad does not want to meet you. <laughs> the fans rushing the field after, I mean, just insane. Somebody stole my mouth guard. I still don't, I mean, it's disgusting. Mouth guard's right here, and someone just grabs it. You're like, I don't know what you're going to do with that, but that's disgusting. Like, that thing has so much dried slobber on it. Like, I felt gross putting my own mouth guard in my mouth, let alone <laughs> some other guy has my mouth guard now. 
I just remember, honestly, a lot of groping. This one young lady had her, like, hand in the, the, the buttocks part of my pants, you know what I mean? Like, it, like all butt cheek, like she had all butt cheek, like, you know? And this is when I was, like, being kind of, you know, like a rock star, being the, riding the wave onto the tunnel. And she had all butt cheek, so good for her. <laughs> Jim Trussell, five and one against Lloyd Carr. When you go over to shake the hand of a great warrior and you knew how hard he and his team prepared for that game and how valiantly they played and uh, a lesser team when they were behind in a game like that away from home might have folded but you were against a warrior whether you're on the winning side or the losing side those aren't long conversations they're respectful moments and uh, uh, you know they were an outstanding team with a great coaching staff and Hopefully the, the moment um, made that clear, you know, that we felt that way. We did the best we could in a really, really hard time for Michigan football. We'll always be disappointed we lost that game, but uh, we won't be disappointed in the way we fought and the way we battled and tried to beat the great Ohio State team. You know, at the end of the game, you're frustrated because you get so close to a goal and, and you don't get there. When you're captain of the team, myself, I was taking blame for that because I didn't prepare my guys the correct way to come out here and win this football game. If I probably would have did a better job of leading my team, then we would have been playing for a national championship. I always had a habit of after every football game, no matter where it was, home or away, I'd always call Bo and ask Bo what he thought about the game. On the way home, I called Kathy Schembechler, her Bo's wife. She saw John, I've been waiting for your call because I know you called Bo after every game. And she says, and I want you to do this for me from now on. After every Michigan football game, will you call me and talk to me just like you used to do, Bo? And I said, sure, Kathy, I'll do that for you. You were on top of the world, you know, you're heading down, you're about to head down to the desert, playing a national title game. Uh, you're, you keep hearing over and over how it should be a rematch. Do you guys deserve a rematch? Yeah, I think so. At that point in time, I actually thought we did. You know, that's debatable. That's debatable. If it was anybody else and one and two would have played each other, or whatever, then the top two teams would have played each other. To tell you the truth, I don't think that they deserve the rematch. I was bruised and bloodied enough in that game where I didn't want to see him again, so I was through with him. I was cool. <laughs> you guys gonna play somebody else. <laughs> Being that we were one or two in the same conference, and then we, you know, one B two. The Urban Meyer, you know, felt he had the campaign for it, talking about Florida should be in there, campaigning. Talking about they don't want to see another game like that. He's just seen one and two play. I don't think Coach Carr came out that whole week and say, say anything about Michigan should be in the national championship. He just let it play out. So Urban campaign, maybe he should run for president. <laughs> if I remember right, USC also had to lose, and they did. And that was in the SC. So I remember that was right at the uh, halftime of our game against Arkansas when USC got beat. And then, you know, then the whole question was, because a lot of people thought that the Ohio State, the team up north should play again in a rematch for the national championship. And, and I don't think, you know, obviously I had a person in the race, so I, we, they asked that question and we came out and said, you know, that's not what this is all about. Everybody should have a shot. It worked. You can't, you can't knock it. It worked. His campaign worked and got his team in there. And they blew the team out. The team that we couldn't beat, they blew them out. So I guess his campaign was right. And sacked from behind is Smith. We understood the magnitude of one versus two, Ohio State versus Michigan, but 
We didn't understand the magnitude of one versus two Ohio State versus Florida in the championship setting. And I think that's why the score was as lopsided as it was. premature thoughts that we shouldn't have had. Me, myself, I should have been more like a horse with blinders on, only worrying about what I needed to worry about and not getting a sense of smelling the roses before we even got there. And the Gators have put this one on ice. Ohio State lost to Florida. We lost to USC. I mean, they probably was a team that could have played in the national championship. They was they was a good team. So I would never say, oh, yeah, we laid it all out in the Ohio State game and we wasn't really there for the, Ohio, the USC game. That's like coming up with an excuse. Like, we were there to play against USC. They were just a better team and they beat us. I think as much as you'd like to see those two teams play again, uh, it was proven in not only the Rose Bowl, where Michigan lost to USC, but in the national championship game, where Ohio State lost to Florida, that Florida was a better team. Just the atmosphere and the amount of energy that was put into that game in Columbus very well may have been the downfall for them in the bowl games. You know what? The funny thing about that game, all you talked about for the next eight years was how the Southeastern Conference took over. And of course, as we all know, Things went downhill pretty quick for the Big Ten after that. What happened after that in the Florida game doesn't affect how I feel still about that game because of how kind of how epic it was and, and just the, the back and forth of it. The only thing is I wish we would have played better defense that game. You always say, gosh, we just got to hold them to one point less than what the O gives us. Well, the O got us 42. <laughs> we almost blew that one. You know, the game's always on Big Ten Network all the time. You know, especially now with the recruits. Coach, I saw you last night, Ohio State versus Michigan on TV. So, still get asked about it. I think when the kids watch that game, they realize that, wow, you were, you were a good player, Coach. Do I think about that game? I try to think about that game as little as possible. When it comes on, I don't even watch it. It's pissed me off just because I know what mistakes killed us. Watching that game, you know, 10 years later, you just still think of what, what could have been. One of the great things about being a part of sport is the memories. Because it goes so quickly, it doesn't last forever. But the one thing that lasts forever are the memories. I've recognized every November 17th since. And it's been one year, two years, and so on. This was going to be a big one. And it's big for a number of reasons, for the significance of the rivalry, the significance of that game, and the significance of the fact that we lost an icon. This was the game of the century. But you have to anticipate right now, with Urban Meyer at Ohio State and Jim Harbaugh at Michigan, as good as this last chapter was, there's probably another one coming here at some point. And I hope there is, because these are moments that are special for college football. That one versus two game still looms with me every time I get a chance to even think about the two. I'm talking about if I see a basketball game, Ohio State versus Michigan, I can go back to 2006 and feel good. It still means everything to me. Now I get a chance to watch the Ohio State University play Michigan with an eight-year-old on this leg and a four-year-old on this leg. And now I'm building another sense of understanding of what it means to be a Buckeye, what it means to be from the Big Ten, and what it means to understand and know that our game, the Ohio State versus the University of Michigan, is the greatest rivalry in college football.